So we're going to briefly talk about the mechanics of breathing. I'm going to skip some things um, because we are short on time. So the first thing that I want you to know is about inspiration. Um, inspiration is just a way too fancy science word for inhaling. Um, you should know, we should have talked about this about a 4,000 times, is that the diaphragm is the muscle that makes breathing happen. So in, inspiration or inhalation is a function, is the active part of breathing. So it has the action of the diaphragm and the diaphragm contracts. So here's your little chest cavity. The diaphragm domes up quite big um, underneath the rib cage and then pulls down when it contracts. When it contracts, it gets smaller and tighter. And that is going to increase the volume of the chest cavity. The chest cavity has, is under negative pressure all the time. And so the, the volume of the, of the lungs fills because it is negative. So negative pressure pulls in. Um, and then if you... So just take a second and inhale or think about your breathing, which of course makes like 90% of people hyperventilate, but just go with it. Um, but... If you are going to really inhale and you want to take a solid inhale, feel, do that. Take a deep, deep breath. And when you do that, it lifts your rib cage and your sternum. You can feel like even if you take a really big breath, like it stretches in your intercostal muscles. And that really moves your rib cage outward and, again, increases the volume much more. Um, because that is negative pressure, it pulls more air in. Um, that is the active part of breathing. The second part of breathing is, generally speaking, a passive process, exhalation or sciency expiration. Um, and when that happens, you relax the diaphragm, it domes back up, and it decreases the volume, or sorry, it increases the volume because you had a, and remember gas laws and all that. So you have the same amount of gas in, a small, in the same fixed area, your diaphragm relaxes, um, that is going to make it dome up. It increases the pressure here and pushes air out. Um, and so it's a simple pr process like that. It is generally speaking uh, passive. However, you have another um, set of intercostal muscles that you can cause to compress your rib cage. Um, and if you blow out hard and you really... Um, actively exhale or powerfully exhale, um, you can speed that up using your intercostal muscles. Um, so those are the things that I want you to know about. Let's talk about respiratory volumes. All right, so there are these respiratory volumes and respiratory function tests. So tidal volume is what you're breathing right now, like just breathing normally. Um, and if you've ever gone to, I've taken my daughter to a um, respiratory specialist and she has had all these tests done. So if you have asthma and you go to um, a respiratory specialist, um, even sometimes it's an allergist, um, they will have you blow into a tube and they will measure all of these things for you. Um, it's a... Um, and from that, if you, you know, are under care for a, you know extended period of time, um, they will have on record whether or not your breathing is better or worse. Um, there's even like a little handheld device you can get at home to see if your, um, the one that they really care about is your expiratory reserve volume. And so you spend a lot of time blowing out <laughs> on this little machine. Um, uh, we have one and we couldn't really train our daughter to use it, but that's one of the things they might set you, send you home with. And the idea is that if you measure yourself at the same time every day, like when you wake up, uh, you might see a decrease before you have an attack. It might be sort of a baseline that changes before your asthma really flares up. So you have tidal volume. That's about 500 milliliters. So like think about your favorite you know, if you drink seltzer out of a one liter bottle, about half of that or a water bottle. Um, so that's what you're breathing in and out all the time. It's a very small fraction of, we're going to look at a graph in a section, second, 
of all of the capacity of your lungs. So your inspiratory reserve volume is what you get when you, if you're just breathing, you inhale normally and then you take the biggest breath you can. Um, depending on how big your body is, um, particularly your chest cavity, that's like another, you know, 15, 1600 um, to, you know, 2700 milliliters of air. So it's a lot more air that you can breathe in on your biggest breath. And then your expiratory reserve volume is, you know, you're breathing normally tidal volume, you get debt to your regular exhale, and then you blow out as much air as you can beyond that. Um, and then that's that 1000 to 1200 beyond your 500 that you're breathing normally. All right, so beyond that, there's a residual volume. And the residual volume is how much is in your lungs all the time that you cannot get out. So if you breathe out and you're like, exhale, 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 you should try it now. There's still like, you feel like you can get more out. You can tell that there's still air in your lungs. And that's true, there is air in your lungs. It's this residual volume. So let's look at this. This is your tidal volume here, this tiny little bit. If you take a giant, giant, giant breath, that's your inspiratory reserve volume. Take a giant exhale, that's your expiratory reserve volume. And then you're back to your title. This residual is always in your lungs, unless something really bad happens to you. Not really bad, something bad happens to you. Um, this needs to stay in your lungs in order to maintain tidal volume. So in order for inspiration to happen, this process, you need to have that residual volume so this happens. Um, if not, it doesn't happen. The movement of your diaphragm is not enough to pull air into your lungs. Um, and you know this because once upon a time, at some point in time, you've had the wind knocked out of you probably as being a human who's lived on this earth. Um, so you fall off the monkey bars and you land on your back. It knocks this residual volume out. And without that residual volume, you do not have this vacuum in your lungs and you can use your diaphragm all you want, but you can't, it doesn't work. It's not pulling air into your lungs. You just have to wait for the passive movement of, of air to come in and you can then you can start to breathe again. Um, it's uh, the first time it happens, usually no one has explained to you unless you've seen some other kid go through it. Um, and usually they're not, you know, you're probably five or six and not articulate enough to explain it. Um, to your friends what it was like. Um, so I try to tell my kids actually about this because it is very, very scary when it happens to you. Um, but that wind knock knocking out, you just have to wait for the air to passively return to your lungs, which it's doing immediately after you after you fall or you get punched in the stomach. That also helps for it, does the job. Um, and you just have to wait for that residual volume to fill back up for your diaphragm, you're working your diaphragm, you're trying hard to breathe, but air isn't coming in because you haven't built back up that vacuum, um, that negative pressure. So it is a, the, it's like 30 seconds, but it's an incredibly long 30 seconds psychologically because you're sure you're gonna die. So that's what happens there. Um, so that's why that residual volume is quite important. Um, there are, a couple different other things that you could, um, your vital capacity is what you call all of this put together. Thank you very much. Sorry, that was a cat problem. Um, your uh, vital capacity is like your biggest inhale, like your expiratory reserve volume to your inspiratory reserve volume. Um, and then your total lung capacity is adding that residual volume to it. Um, let's see. This is just a comparison, um, average males and females, and this has to do with body size. Um, so, and, you know, it's just for comparison's sake, um, you know, it has to do with, you know, sexual dimorphism of body size. Um, let's see, don't care. Okay, we think we need to talk about this because we need to be able to talk about um, disorders. So force vital capacity is the is a test where you blow out 
gas as fast as you can. Um, and it's a it's the slide that we just skipped talked about blowing out air as fast as much air as you can in a minute. Um, so normally you can expel 80% of your vital capacity in the first second. Any less than that is going to be this thing called obstructive pulmonary disease. Um, if you get 80% in the first second, but then you can't get the rest of it out, that's going to be a restrictive disease. And we're going to talk about what those things are in a second. Um, let's see. Yes. So that brings us to respiratory disorders. The first one is not actually a respiratory disorder. Um, specifically, it's a, it's a um, sort of a, it's a, like a umbrella term for a bunch of different diseases. So it's chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or COPD. Um, if you go to a nursing home, you will find a lot of people with COPD. It is a major cause of death of people in North America, um, particularly people who have smoked in their past. So it is something that is irreversible. Um, actually, I talked to one of my parents' friends who's in his late 60s um, last summer, and he's like, oh, I've got this thing. I have a hard time breathing, and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, you should go. And he was like really having a hard time breathing. He went to urgent care, and he's like, yeah, they say I have... Um, chronic bronchitis. I'm like, yeah, you have COPD. And he's like, oh, because I smoked a bunch when I was young. And he's like a choral director. It's like, you know. You know. So um, people, this will not be the same thing that will happen to people your age when they're old or even my age when they're old, because many fewer of us smoked cigarettes. Um, but for people my parents' age and maybe your parents' age who smoked cigarettes a lot when they were kids um, and in their 20s and 30s, or maybe even still do, um, this is something that chronic obstructive pulmonary disease um, of one of these types is a is something that happens. Um, so more than 80% of them have a history of patients have a history of smoking and it's characterized by this term called dyspnea. Um, dyspnea is air hunger, which means that it's like you just always feel like you need to inhale more, but you can't get that air in. And we'll talk about why that is. Um, and hypoventilation. So not enough oxygen, um, more. And so actually what you can't do with these disorders is get air out. It's the opposite of asthma where you can't get air in. Um, so you can't get air out. You retain carbon dioxide and it causes acidosis um, because carbon dioxide makes things like liquids acidic. Um, and then it causes hypoxemia, which is a type of hypoxia. So emphysema is a type of COPD. Um, it's when the alveoli become floppy and sort of lose their tone because the elastic cartilage or the elastic fibers um, really kind of just disintegrate. Um, and it makes it just harder and harder for people to breathe. So people end up spending you know, three or four times more energy on breathing. So you and I and all the other healthy people in the world breathe use this about 5% of our energy for the process of inhaling and exhaling. Um, and people with emphysema are spending 15 to 20% of their total energy breathing. So they're exhausted all the time because just breathing uses so much energy. Um, so what happens is you can force air in because that's the active part through the bronchioles, but because the elastic cartilage has disintegrated, um, they collapse and you can't get this air out. It sort of like moves out on its own, which is very slowly. And that causes the alveoli, see how they're nice and firm, like little circles here. And then here they're all blown out. Um, it causes the alveoli to become expanded and um, less functional because they're also always full of carbon dioxide. They get all the oxygen out. Um, it also is going to destroy the capillaries around them, which are very delicate. Um, and it decreases pulmonary circulation. Um, and that's going to stress the right ventricle of the heart. It cause, And then it's going to cause... Um, congestive heart failure. So the right side of the heart will fail. 
Um, so that's sort of the long-term um, trajectory of that, of emphysema. Um, people with emphysema, you will see them carrying around oxygen tanks with them. That's one of the things that ha that is like they need to be on oxygen because the alveoli that are still working, they need to get as much oxygen to those um, alveoli as they can. Chronic bronchitis is um, very similar to that. Um, again, it's the it's inhalation of um, irritants that causes this, um, but it's the bronchi that become. It's not the it's not the alveolar sacs, but it's really the bronchi, and they make it they make just like excessive amounts of mucus, and the mucus obstructs the um, the air pathways, and it does then the same thing. So it um, keeps the air in the alveoli. Um, they can't it can't get out. They swell. Um, it damages and it does, it has sort of after that the same trajectory as emphysema, um, but it has the mucus component. So good times. All right. So that's the end of COPD. We've talked a great deal about asthma and I can see all of you guys whose parents reported that you had asthma, even in like kindergarten and first grade, um, you have like a little alert in power school and I can, you know, I am actually legally obligated to click on all those alerts, medical alerts. Um, and so one in 10 Americans suffer, suffer for asthma, asthma. That is no different here. I can tell from power school. Um, and asthma is a, as I said before, a problem with, um, the, the smooth muscle constricting in a way that is not appropriate. Um, and it's actually kind of never appropriate, but it happens to people who, and you, everybody has a trigger. It might be illness. It might be exercise induced. It might be allergy induced. You might have a certain allergen that causes your asthma episodes, um, which is why you might see an allergist to have it treated. Um, that's one of the things that um, my daughter went to an extensive allergist appointment um, and turns out that that's not it. She just gets sick and then it just happens. Um, but it causes wheezing, dyspnea, um, coughing, chest tightness, but it is unlike um, COPD, which is not reversible. This is totally reversible. Um, you take your rescue inhaler it puts some albuterol, which is a stimulant, down into your bronchi, um, and the bronchi, and it causes those bronchi to open up and relax, um, and it is completely reversible. So that is good to know. All right, tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is an infection caused by a bacteria, and once upon a time, one in three Americans, one in three adults, not Americans, all people, one in three adults died of tuberculosis. Good times. That's when you cough up your lungs. Yeah. Um, so essentially what happens is you get a infection and it eats away and you can see these fibroids and eventually you can just kind of cough these fibroids up. Um, if you've seen like Moulin Rouge, Everybody has tuberculosis. They like, that's what that symbol, like in a movie, you know someone has TB if they cough up blood. It's like the thing. Um, but tuberculosis was until the 1930s when they found antibiotics for it rampant and people died of it. Um, people still die of it, but it tends to be something that's a comorbidity with um, like HIV um, or because it's a bacteria, there are some bacteria, there are some resistant strains. Um, particularly in the old Soviet Union, there are some um, resistant strains. Um, and you need to, if you get and contract tuberculosis, it is not deadly now, but you need to take 12 months of antibiotics. Like, that's not 12 weeks, that's a year of antibiotics that you have to take religiously in order to make sure that you kill all of the bacteria um, because that's what happens with antibiotic resistant bacteria. Um, so yeah, 
And so I know that we bemoan, and if you had a particular biology teacher, he, she may have bemoaned all the people who die of obesity. Um, and I'm sure that once upon a time, I think I probably stood up on my soapbox and said, everybody should die of obesity. Die coughing out your lungs is a bad way to go. Um, and I'm going to go with, I, I'm going to hold to that, that I would rather die of obesity than coughing out my lungs. So bring me the Oreos. Um, okay. So looking at, so when you talk about, um, obstructive pulmonary disease, you're talking about like obstructing the way in restrictive pulmonary diseases are things like tuberculosis. So tuberculosis is a restrictive pulmonary disorder um, because it is restricting the amount of oxygen you can get in. And you can see this progression. So here you have your little infection and how it's spreading. And here you have a fibroid and now you have a bunch of fibroid and the rest of your lungs are still full of um, have more tuberculosis and you're you're pretty soon gonna die from this. Um, again, one in three Americans, one in three everybody's adults, bad news. Okay, lung cancer. Lung cancer is the number one cancer death in America, uh, more than breast and prostate and colorectal cancer all put together. Um, it's also super deadly. It has a five-year survival rate of 17%, um, so that is not good. Um, the good part is that 90% of the people who get it get it from smoking. Um, and let's put vaping in that category um, because I think that we can safely say now that, va that vaping is not safe. Um, the thing about lung cancer is that it metastasizes, meaning that it goes to other parts of your body um, very aggressively and it spreads widely around your body um, very quickly and so it's very difficult to treat. Um, it goes to places like your brain and your bones and your liver. Um, so it is not, it is not good. Um, so that also would be a restrictive pulmonary disease. So restrictive are going to be, um, tuberculosis and lung cancer and obstructive would be asthma, um, chronic bronchitis and emphysema. Okay. That is the end of that. Please make sure that you turn your notes in online so I can give you credit for them in Google Classroom. And that is the end, my friends, of anything I will teach you in anatomy and physiology. It has been a real journey and I myself have enjoyed all of it. I bet you didn't enjoy all of it, but I hope you enjoyed some of it. So I bid you an academic adieu.